Hello and welcome to another lecture for interactive computer graphics. Yeah. How are you all doing? Good? All right, excellent. Uh, we have a ton of ground to cover today. Um, so this is going to be a lot of relatively packed lecture in terms of the stuff that we're going to cover. All right, so we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to talk about lights and lighting and shading. We're going to spend most of our time talking about shading. Uh, so those of you who have taken Introduction to Computer Graphics course, you will see that I'm going to be using a lot of slides that I've used for that, for that course, but I'm going to be going over those slides a lot faster today than, than what I did for the Introduction to Computer Graphics course. So we're going to actually talk about um, quite a bit more than, than I normally allocate for the Introduction to Computer Graphics course. All right, so today's topic, very, very important topic, is going to be shading. All right, let's start with shading. So what is shading? Shading is what? Uh, well, this is shading. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, this is literally shading. But, you know, in, in graphics, when we say shading, we don't actually mean like hand-drawn shading stuff. We're talking about computing the color of stuff, com computing the color of pixels. That's what's shading. So like if I have a 3D object like this, obviously it has no color. Uh, well, the color is black, you could say. So if I were to compute its color, let's say its color is red, I mean, obviously it's not going to look like this, right? When I do proper shading, it's going to look more like this. So you'll see that there's some parts that are darker, some parts that are brighter. It's, it's about lighting. So shading is very much about lighting. And we're going to talk about how lighting impacts shading and all that stuff. So that's our topic for today. All right. So here's what I mean. Let's say that let's, let's take things simple. I have this simple flat surface and it's, it's looking black because there's no light. I need light. So let's put a light here. All right, I have light. Oh, okay, it was red. Now I can see its color. So I'm going to use omega to determine the direction of the light source. Let's say that this is the point in, at the center of this plane that I'm interested in computing its color. Or let's say that, for broad, broadly speaking, I, I want to compute the color of this, this small piece of plane. Um, and the light direction is omega, right? I'm going to be using omega. This is omega for representing the light direction, the, the direction towards the light source, okay? So if I take this plane, and if I rotate it a little bit, you see what's happening? It's getting darker. I rotate some more, it's getting even darker than that. If I rotate it too much, <laughs> now the lighting direction is sort of behind the plane. When that happens, well, obviously, I'm not going to see any light on this side of the plane, right? All the light is on the other side of the plane, so this side is completely dark. So, it's black. Uh, so, you rotate it further, you see, like, on this side, I don't see anything. So, if I want to have light on this side, I need to rotate it back, and now I'm seeing a little bit of light. Now, some more and some more. Okay, a lot more light right now. So, what's happening here? This, this, the amount of light on the surface is changing based on how the, the surface is, is rotated according to the incoming light direction, right? So let's, let's investigate what's happening here in this side view. Um, it's easier to look at these kind of things in like a 2D cross section. So this is where the light is coming from. Now imagine a beam of light that is hitting the surface, okay? This beam of light um, is, it's, that's um, spread over a, a, some amount of the, the surface area, okay? Imagine that. Now, um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this surface and I'm going to start rotating it. So, to, to represent that, let's place our surface normal vector. So, surface normal vector is a, the vector that is perpendicular to the surface. That's a very important concept in shading. We're going to be using that a lot and, and you'll see in a minute why. So, in this case, the surface normal vector is exactly the uh, vector of incoming light. Well, light is coming from above, so incoming light direction is 
towards the light source, right? So both omega and n, n here is representing the surface normal, they are in this case exactly the same vector. But when I start rotating, when I start rotating this plane, they're going to be separated. Right? So I rotated a little bit, now surface normal is slightly in a different direction. I rotated some more. Uh, right, let me rotate it some more. You see what's happening here? So the, previously, this, the same beam of light was eliminating some area on that surface. Now it's eliminating, it's spread over a larger area on that surface. So the same amount of light is now spread over a larger area on that surface. And that's the reason why we're going to be getting less light per unit area. Okay, less light per unit area because the same amount of light is now spread over a larger area on that surface. And that's a very, very important concept. Uh, and that's going to depend on this angle, uh, let's call it theta, this angle theta between the surface normal and the incoming light direction. All right. So um, let me let me see what's let me show you what's happening here. I'm going to just move things around a little bit just to make room for us. Just, you know what? Let's enlarge it just a little bit. So this was the, our beam of light. So previously, when our surface was perpendicular to the light direction, where the surface normal was aligned with the incoming light direction, this was our surface, right? And then I rotated and uh, went all the way here. Now, this beam of light, let's say that it was eliminating an area of one unit. Okay, so this, the area was one unit before we rotated it. All right, now when I rotated it, let's say that it became an area, let's call it something, S. Why not? Okay, so what's important is for us to understand the relationship between how the amount of light coming to the surface changes based on this, this, this angle. Right, so initially over here, let's say the amount of light coming to that surface was L. Okay, so L is the amount of light spread, out, spread around on a, a surface of uh, area one. Okay, now the same amount of light, when I rotate it, will spread over an area that's defined by S, right? So let's, okay, we're, we're looking at it in 2D cross section, so I'm talking about length when I say area. Uh, so length is S, so the amount of light that I receive on this surface after I rotated it is going to be L over S. Right now it's spread over S, and that's why it's going to be L over S. All good? Um, so I need to somehow compute this based on this, this angle theta. So let's, let's do that. So theta over here. Uh, now, in this case, um, the surface was perpendicular to the light direction, so the remaining angle here is going to be pi over 2 minus theta, right? Uh, and surface normal is perpendicular, always perpendicular to the surface, so the, the angle on this side is going to be theta as well. All right, so let me ask you, what is cosine theta? You should be able to say that cosine theta is going to be 1 over s, right? 1 this side over s. That's going to be cosine theta. So this L over s is equal to L cosine theta, right? So cosine theta will tell us the amount of light I'm receiving per unit area, right? So I'm going to be uh, scaling the amount of light coming to that surface uh, with cosine theta to figure out the amount of light per area on that surface. And we're going to call this our geometry term. That's a very, very important, important term uh, that we're going to be using this term to determine the amount of, area, uh, amount of light we're receiving on the surface. Okay? So basically what I'm saying is that I have this surface, I can rotate the surface or I can just move the light around. Like if I move the light around such that the light direction is not aligned with the surface normal, the amount of light that I'm receiving on the surface is going to be scaled by this angle theta. All right. So in this case, I am my surface color is red. Let's let's say that KD is my material property for for this material on the surface that is red. It's exactly this color. 
and it is what I'm seeing on the surface, what I'm seeing, the color I'm seeing on the surface is KD cosine theta. All right. So what is cosine theta? Cosine theta can be computed very easily. Now we talked about this when we were talking about the vectors. So if n here is a unit vector and omega here is a unit vector and they're supposed to be unit vectors, if they are unit vectors, then cosine theta is just going to be the dot product of these two vectors, right? So I can write uh, the same color as kd times n dot omega, because that's exactly cosine theta. All good? But of course, that depends on the light intensity here. <laughs> so we didn't quite talk about this. We said, oh, light intensity, what is that, one unit? Okay, whatever. If, if my light intensity, if, if the light is darker, of course, this is going to look darker. If the light is brighter, of course, it's going to look brighter, right? So uh, I'm going to be using this light intensity to determine the amount of light that I see. So the final color that I'm going to be seeing on the surface is going to depend on the, the light intensity, the geometry term, and the color of the surface. Right? Uh, so that's going to be the pixel color when I'm doing shading. More specifically, if this material is what we call a lumbersion or diffuse material, this is going to be the formula that we're going to be using for computing the color on the surface, right? So the lumbersion material, this diffuse material, is the simplest material uh, that we can think of. Uh, the entire material property is defined by a single color value. In this case, it's, it's red, right? So this is our my material property. This is just the amount of light that's hitting the surface. Right, the, the amount of light from the light source and uh, multiply by the geometry term. All good? Okay, so let's see what a uh, lumbersion material would look like on, let's say, a teapot. Right, so this is a teapot with a lumbersion material on it. There's some light, actually light is coming from multiple directions here. It's not just from one direction. There are multiple light sources eliminating this teapot. Uh, but yeah, you see it's it's... Looks okay. I can see the 3D shape of the teapot and it's shaded nicely. Um, doesn't look particularly appealing though. I'm going to show you another one. Uh, what do you think about this one? So this one uh, is a different material. So the one up here is a lumbersion material that has only diffuse only. Uh, this one has that diffuse component, but also what we call has the specular component. Um, and and that's the you know the the white stuff here that you see that the shiny bits uh, here that's coming uh, because of this this specular term here. So the specular reflections. Let's talk about those specular reflections. You can think of specular reflections for a material as the reflections of the light source. Now we're going to talk about this a, a bit more in a different context uh, later on. But for the time being. Let's think about specular, specular reflections as the reflections of the light source, which is not inaccurate, actually. That's a proper way of thinking about specular reflections. So if I move this light source and if I light source and I start seeing the, the reflection of the light source, uh, you know, it's, it's creating this, this um, what we call a specular lobe, um, uh, specular reflection on the surface. So I move the lights, of course, the, the position of this, this specular, specular highlight here it depends on the orientation of the surface and the light source, right? So if I move the light around, I'm going to have this reflection in a different place, right? And that's why when I have these teapots and the teapot is, is rotating, the position of the specular highlight is changing based on the orientation of the surface and the illumination. In this case, the illumination is um, constant. It's just the teapot is rotating around. Uh, but you see the specular, the position of the specular highlight on the teapot is moving around because you know, it's the reflection of the light source. And of course, if you rotate the object around, it's going to be in a different position. So let's see how we could compute the specular reflections. Again, we're going to look at it in, in, in 2D cross section here. Uh, I'm going to have my light source and this is going to be my um, my light direction as before. Now, the reflection of the light source does not only depend on the, the light direction omega here, but it will also depend on, on where I'm looking at this surface from. So, if I look at the surface from this direction, I might see some specular reflections, right? But if I go around and look at it 
from here, I probably won't see the reflection of the, the light source that much, right? So it's going to be a lot more visible from this side. So the, the direction from which you're looking at this surface is going to be very, very important for specular reflections. So if I place my camera here, so this is where I'm looking at, and I'm going to use V to represent the, the viewing direction. That's why I call it V. Uh, so this is going to determine uh, the amount of specular highlights that I see exactly at this point, right? So my view direction and the incoming light direction, and of course the surface normal, right? Now, how do I compute the specular reflections? Well, that's going to depend on what kind of material I have here. Now, if this is a Lambertian material that has no specular reflections whatsoever, then specular reflections are going to be zero or black, right? If the surface has some specular reflections, well, that depends on what kind of a surface it is and what kind of, how do I model the specular reflections? Now, uh, there are various ways of defining these specular reflections. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is going to be one of the first and the simplest model, uh, probably arguably the simplest model out there, uh, that's going to be, we're going to start with the, the Fong specular reflection model, right? The Fong specular reflection model defines the specular reflections as follows. I'm going to first take this, um, to take, take this light direction omega, and I'm going to reflect that direction based uh, off of the surface. So if this was a perfectly flat mirror, and I'm supposed to see the reflection of the light source, I can only see the reflection of the light source from a perfect mirror reflection direction, right? And the perfect mirror reflection direction is going to be this one. So R here is representing the perfect reflection direction of this omega, all right? So if this angle is theta, then obviously this angle is also theta. Now, the following specular reflection model is going to look at the angle between this perfect specular reflection direction and my viewing direction. It's going to look at this angle, let's call it phi. Right? So um, the, the model for Fong, the, 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 the Fong model, is a relatively simple model. The way that it's going to define this, this um, the amount of specular reflection is going to be based on this, this very, very simple formula. Uh, so what is what is this? It cosine phi. It's uh, like the it's sort of accounting for the separation between these two angles. Cosine phi is going to be one if they are exactly in the same direction, and it's going to be smaller than one if they, the two vectors are not if the uh, view direction and the sur perfect reflection direction are different, right? Uh, so this is going to be a value. You can compute it using the dot product of uh, v and r. And this is raised to a power of, I represented it as, as alpha here, that's the, the shininess parameter. So, um, and of course, the, the amount of the magnitude of specular reflection, the amount of specular reflection I'm going to get off of that surface is going to be another term that I'm going to have to specify. So my Fong specular reflections are defined by this specular reflection color property of my material and this alpha, that is the shininess property of the material. So these two are going to be my material properties that's going to determine uh, the amount of specular illumination that I see, uh, specular highlight that I see at this point. Okay, this is the Fong model. It's a very simple model. It sort of uh, imitates what uh, materials um, look like in reality. It's not a very realistic material model. It's not a physically based material model, but it's a... Uh, it's a pretty good, uh, simple approximation of how materials reflect light, right? So this is going to be our phone model. So the, the total amount of specular illumination that I will see at that point, of course, will also depend on the intensity of the incoming lights, uh, incoming uh, light over here, right? So I have this light source. This is the I is the amount of light that's coming. That's the light intensity multiplied by the specular reflection color. And, and then this phone term here. Good. So 
typically uh, materials defined by this uh, the, the Fong model will also have a diffuse component. So there's going to be there's going to be a diffuse like Lambertian component, and on top of that, there's going to be a specular uh, reflections. So um, we can add these two together. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is that you can think about it this way. Light that comes to that surface, a percentage of that light is going to, is going to reflect diffusely. That's very much like a Lambertian material, so it's going to reflect in all directions equal amount. So that's defined by the Lambertian model. And a part of that is going to reflect specularly a portion of that is going to reflect specularly, and that's going to be de defined by the Fong specular reflection model. So I can write the total color that I see with the Fong material model like so. So I have this diffuse term here, and I have a specular term here, right? So a percentage of the lights defined by this KD term is going to reflect diffusely. Uh, the percentage of that, uh, of the, of the lights that's defined by KS term is going to reflect specularly. So there's a diffuse term plus specular term. All right. So when you look at the surface from any direction, I'm going to see some of the specular, uh, some of the diffuse and some of the specular. All right. Now, so this is going to be the, the Fong material model. Uh, and this is how people typically write the Fong material model. Or of course, the, um, the light intensity is the same on, on either side. So I can just move it outside like so, I move everything else in the parentheses. So this is like the following material model uh, multiplied by the incoming light intensity. Now this is a little confusing actually. Like this is how it was written back in the day when the Fong material model was first uh, proposed. And still, like if you look online, you will probably see the Fong material model represented like so. Uh, but there's a little bit of a confusing part here Remember, this cosine theta is the geometry term. It has nothing to do with this diffuse part. It, has, it just determines the amount of lights I'm receiving per area on the surface. So this is not specific to diffuse. I mean, this should be really outside of this, this parentheses, right? And this is what makes sense. So this is what the Fong model is sort of supposed to be, but it isn't. It isn't because the Fong material model actually has this hidden one over cosine theta here. All right. So, I mean, there are good reasons why it is there, uh, why it's defined like this. I'm not planning to get into that uh, today, uh, but you should uh, think about the Fong material model like this. So this is how the Fong material model is actually defined. But of course, you can write it in a simpler form by, uh, you know, canceling out these cosines and putting the cosine over here. Now, actually, if you omit this cosine, uh, what we end up with is what's called the modified Fong material model. Very similar to the Fong material model, it just doesn't have this 1 over cosine theta. But the Fong material model is going to have this 1 over cosine theta. Although, when people write this, this model, they typically write it like this. They just you know, cancel out, it just looks a little bit simpler. And historically, that's how it was presented, because back in the day, people didn't really think about this cosine theta as the geometry term. Uh, but now, today, we know that you know, it's the geometry term, it should apply to both diffuse and specular, so it should, yeah, it, yeah, the proper way of writing this would be adding the one over cosine theta here. All good? All right. So um, another thing, this is actually a sort of like a simplified representation. When you're implementing it, you need to be careful about one thing here, that is this cosine theta can be negative. How can it be negative? Well, if the light is coming from behind the surface, it can be negative. And if the light is coming from behind the surface, then, well, we shouldn't get any illumination on the surface, right? So a more proper way of writing this would be like so. <laughs> if it's less than zero, oh, it's going to be zero. Okay. Well, actually, same goes for this term, because that can also be less than zero. I can also write it like so to make sure that it's never going to be less than zero. When you're actually computing this, uh, well, if this cosine term is less than zero, that is 
That is, if the light is coming from behind the surface, I shouldn't see any diffuse or specular illumination, right? So a more proper way of thinking about this would be like this. So if this is, this is zero, then the whole thing is zero, right? If it's, this is not zero, I, I don't have to multiply and then divide by cosine theta when I'm implementing this, obviously. Uh, but just this is to, sh to show that if this is zero, this whole thing is going to be zero, okay? All right, and cosine theta again is the dot product uh, of the surface normal and the light direction, and cosine uh, phi is the dot product of the perfect reflection direction and the view direction. So to be able to compute the Fong material model, you just need to compute these terms and then you're done. So the one thing that we didn't really talk about how to compute is this perfect reflection direction. And that's actually fairly easy to, uh, easy to evaluate. Uh, so this is, I'm just showing you how to do that. Like if I t were to take this um, uh, incoming light direction and I, that is, I just looked at the opposite direction. And then I'm going to take the dot product of these two vectors. That's going to give me the length of this vector. If I multiply it by this, this vector, I'm going to get this, this green vector. So this green vector is the dot product. That's going to give me the length or the cosine theta. <laughs> and uh, this length multiplied by n is going to give me this green vector, right? So if I take that green vector and I add that green vector over here, I'm going to get to this plane. And if I add it again, I'm going to get to this perfect reflection direction. So the formula for the perfect reflection direction is going to be this, all right? So this could be applied in, in various ways. And so you're going to have to computers in your shaders. So let's take a look at the phone material model really quickly. Like what, what would it look like if I had different uh, parameters, particularly the, the alpha parameter. So in this case, I'm going to say that the diffuse is, is red and specular is white, which is not very realistic. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and let's say alpha is one. Alpha one makes this specular component really this overwhelming gigantic specular highlights. Normally, we would like this alpha to be a lot greater than one. So if it's two, it's going to get smaller. If I take to five, it gets smaller to 10, even smaller than that, 20, uh, say 50, 100, 200, 500. It's getting smaller and smaller. You see, like 1,000, 10,000. Well, actually, this, this alpha can be all the way up to infinity. So if this material is something like a perfect mirror, it's supposed to be infinity, All right? Sometimes it's called as the delta material. Um, yeah, like a perfect mirror. All right, so what's, um, one thing I'm gonna say here is that this is um, a, a model that sort of um, defines how materials um, look under light um, in, in, a very, in very simple terms. Uh, and it works out okay. I mean, it's not a physically based material model, so it's not going to give you exactly what a material looks like. And as you can see, most of these things look kind of like plastic, right? A little bit. Uh, so the following material model will look a little bit like plastic, not exactly like plastic either, actually. All right, so this is our Fong material model. This is not the only material model. Um, Jim Blinn improved this material model a little bit. So we call this Blinn material model. Uh, and his material model is uh, very similar, but slightly different, which makes a small but important difference. So the Blinn material model does not look at the perfect reflection direction. Instead, it looks at this direction that we call the half, half vector. This half vector is going to be the halfway between this light direction omega and the view direction. So the light direction omega and the view direction, I'm going to have the same angle here. Uh, and more specifically, it is defined as this vector. So omega plus, that's light direction plus the view direction normalized. So if you add these two uh, unit vectors and normalize them, it gives you the vector exactly between the two of them, right? So that's going to be the half vector h. And that's how the Blinn material model will define its, its half vector. And it's going to define this phi angle 
as the angle between the surface normal and the half vector. Right? So uh, that's the only difference really. Everything else is exactly the same. In this case, cosine phi is going to be n dot h. Right? So if you compare the blend material model and the Fong material model, uh, it, they only differ by the way that you, they define this, this phi angle. So bl blend material is going to use this angle between the surface normal and uh, the half vector. And the Fong material uh, is going to use um, the angle between the perfect reflection direction and the view direction. Uh, so here, what you need to see is that if I move my viewing direction and bring it closer to the perfect reflection direction, this H is going to come closer to N. So take a look at this. If I move this viewing direction up a little bit, as you can see, uh, my, the surface normal is going to be exactly halfway between uh, the incoming light direction and the view direction. Right? And uh, when I separate them, uh, I'm going to have different angles, a different angle over here and a different angle over here. And these two angles are not going to be exactly the same. In, in, in 2D, this is going to be uh, that you can find a relationship between these two angles. But remember, we're actually trying to render 3D surfaces. In 3D, like we're just looking at a cross section here, then in this case, all of the vectors are on the same plane. But in 3D, they don't have to be. You know, light can come from this direction and viewing direction can be some other direction and surface normal can be something else. They don't have to be in the same plane. In that case, actually, what happens is that with this blend material model, the shape of the specular lobe changes. So if you were to compare blend and fong, the same, um, the same parameters, the same material parameters will not give you a specular highlight of the same size. It's also not going to give you a specular highlight of the same shape. The shape is slightly different. So let me show you what 100 here. As you can see, the Fong material model shows a little bit elongated uh, specular highlight over here, while the blend material is going to give you something that looks a bit more circular. So people argued that uh, the blend material model gives you um, somewhat more realistic looking specular reflections and that's why it is preferred and it's um, as easy to implement as the Fong material model. So in terms of implementation complexity there isn't really much of a difference. Well there's another thing that we need to consider. Uh, now imagine this. What happened here? Uh, well I just turned off all the lights on, on this side of the slides. Right? <laughs> so Actually, I have a sphere here that you cannot see. You cannot see because there's no light. So let's put a light here. Oh, now there's a light. You can see the sphere, right? Now, can you tell that it's a sphere? I mean, you can only see half of the sphere. You cannot see the other half. You cannot see the other half because the light can only illuminate one half of that sphere. Now, um, this is a practical problem uh, because in, what happens is that in reality, Light doesn't always come directly from the light sources. In, the, in, in reality, light is something that bounces off in, uh, in a room. You have one light source and that light uh, eliminates the objects or the walls of that room. And then the light starts bouncing off of that, uh, the walls and other surfaces in the room. And it starts, that reflected light starts eliminating other things. So basically, there is light in a room coming from all over the place. It's not, light does not only come from the light sources directly, but it can also come indirectly from other objects that are reflecting the light. That's why in a realistic environment, it's very hard to illuminate a part of the surface, a part of a surface, and make the rest of the surface completely pitch black. It's, it's very, very hard to accomplish this in reality. So this doesn't look very realistic. But computing this reflected light uh, in, inside a room off of other surfaces, that turns out to be a very, very complicated task. It's, it's very computationally expensive. Um, back in the day, we could not afford that. Today, we, we have methods that we can use for computing that. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. But a, a simple trick that people came up with back in the day is, how about instead of trying to compute this really massive light equilibrium inside, a, inside a, a room where light is bouncing off of all these surfaces and everything is eliminating everything else. 
instead of, instead of looking at this really complicated stuff, let's just concentrate on the light that's directly coming from the light sources and really crudely approximates all the light that's coming from everything else as like some constant ambient elimination term. So I'm going to add an ambient elimination term over here and you'll see that now I started seeing the rest of that sphere. Right. So this was a very practical problem back in the day. Like we didn't want everything, but we didn't want our surfaces to be pitch black in some places when there's no direct elimination coming to those parts. So we added this simple ambient term, very, very crude and simple approximation of the ambient light that exists in the scene. And if we put this inside our uh, blind Fong material model, it will look like this. I have this constant ambient light multiply by some ambient color term. That's a material property. Now, this, this sort of an, uh, formulation is what happens under the hood in uh, a lot of graphic software. But typically, you know, what's, what, what do you pick for this ambient color value? What, what, what's that supposed to be? I mean, okay, there's really no reason, no good reason for making this ambient color value anything else than the color of the surface, right? And what's the color of the surface? Well, you can think of the diffuse component as the color of surface. So it kind of makes sense to set this ambient term equal to the diffuse term. All right, so that's a simple thing to do. But a lot of uh, graphic software will allow you to set this ambient color separately. Uh, for artistic reasons, you may want to set a different color value for the ambient color. But, you know, in a, in, in a typical material, you would expect... You, Really, this, this should be the diffuse color of the surface. All right, so this is what I plan to talk about in terms of the material model. Uh, now, the, what we talked about is the, the Blin and Fong material models. Um, these are not the most realistic material models. There are a lot more realistic materials we have today, and I'm planning to talk about them a little bit, but this is what I'm going to ask you guys to implement. Uh, because, you know, uh, Fong and, and Blin, more specifically, the material model is still, uh, still used, well, not as, as commonly used in practice, but it's a very good material model to implement as your first material model. So if you haven't implemented shading before, this is where you should start. And once you get a hang of it, you could uh, experiment with different, uh, more realistic, more physically based material models that are going to be uh, significantly more difficult to implement, right? So this is a very simple material model and it works really well, actually. It's been used for, for decades. People, people made movies using this material model, right? So it was, it's, it's, it's not that bad, is what I'm trying to say. So today people prefer more uh, newer, more physically based material models and there are good reasons for, for picking and using more realistic material models. But I, I don't think this material model should be undermined. It's still a very, very simple and very, very powerful material model, nonetheless. All right, so this was our material model. I'm going to move on to another thing. Okay, our next thing, next thing I'm going to talk about is going to be lights. So we cannot do shading without lights, right? This is what we're trying to compute. And there are a whole bunch of light formulations used in computer graphics. There are some, some examples of, of different lights used in, some of them are used for interactive rendering. All of them are used in one way or another uh, for offline rendering. So we have simpler light formulations used light, such as directional lights and spotlights. So these are going to be the light sources that we're going to be using. And there are also more realistic light sources, light sources that, that have some areas like area light sources that we call them. They could be rectangles, disk, or sphere, or mesh, or whatever. Or skylights, lights coming from all directions in a scene. That's going to be the skylight. So all these sort of light sources are used both in offline rendering and interactive rendering. But we're going to start with the simpler stuff, right? We're going to concentrate on the more simpler light sources uh, right now. We're going to look at the directional lights. A directional light is very simple. Um, it just it's a light source that has intensity and direction. That's it. <laughs> so light is coming from that direction, like so, right? So can you think of something that this kind of light source could approximate? For example, this is a somewhat crude approximation of 
some light source that is far, 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 far away, such as the sun, right? Sun is far. So sunlight is very much like directional light. I mean, yeah, it direction technically changes, but when I look at the sun, sun is in that direction. Let's say if I move over here, it's not like sun's direction is going to be drastically different, right? Because my motion from here to there is not that much considering how far the sun is. So this is not a bad approximation for something like sunlight. So that's why it's actually used a lot in practice today for approximating things like sunlight. Uh, so when you're computing this, of course, the light direction that we're going to be using, let's say I'm shading this point, the light direction that I'm going to be using is going to be direction towards the light, towards where the light is coming from. So that's going to be omega, okay? Very easy, like you just, you have the light intensity, you have the light direction, you can just feed it inside your blend form shading equations and you can, you can compute them, blend form material models, and you can compute them. Fairly easy, right? Another easy light model that we're going to be using is going to be point light. A point light uh, is, well, as the name suggests, it's a point that's emitting light in all directions. Sometimes it's called an omnilight because it's a, you know, uh, spreading light in all directions, emitting light in all directions. For a point light, it has its intensity, but its, its direction is going to depend on where you are, right? So you're going to look at the direction from the, let's say this is the point that I'm trying to shade, the light direction is going to be direction from this point towards where the light source is. So very much like the directional light source, this is the point light source is going to have two uh, parameters. One of them is going to be the light intensity. They share the same thing. The other one is going to be, in this case, light position. So directional light has a light direction, point light has the light position, all right? And from the light position, it's fairly easy to compute the light direction. Just remember that this is supposed to be a unit vector. Um, another simple light source, relatively simple light source, is going to be a spotlight. Spotlight is uh, very much like a point light source, but it has a limited angle uh, through which it's emitting light. So in this case, light is only emitted in these directions that are shown over here. For all other directions, the, this particular light source, this particular spotlight is not going to emit any, any, any illumination. All right? So we're going to be dealing with these simple light sources. They're going to be much easier to handle than other types of light sources that I, I showed a little bit ago. All right, so this is what I plan to talk about in terms of lighting. Uh, I'm going to end it right here because we still have a lot more to talk about before we can do shading. All right, so the thing that we're going to need to handle is shading transformations. You'll see that this is actually very, very important for us to be able to do shading. Oh, okay. Remember we talked about viewing transformations when I was doing the review of the transformations? We said we have this model space and then we have this, this world space and, and from going from model space to world space, we had this matrix. That's what we call the model transformation matrix. And then we had this um, view space defined by our camera. And to go from a world space to the view space, we had our view transformation, right? So if you look at these, from going from these three spaces, we go from model space to world space using model transformation. And then from world space to camera space or view space using view transformation. And then from view space, we do projection to go to the canonical view volume, right? This is how we've been doing rendering. Of course, we can do uh, what's called the model view transformation to go from model space directly to view space and skipping the world space. You just multiply this model transformation matrix and the view transformation matrix, you get model view transformation matrix. And what we used for the previous project is, was the model view projection transformation, right? So this is a transformation matrix that is, you know, multiply the model view matrix where the projection matrix and you get the model view projection matrix that uh, defines the entire transformation. So this was our viewing transformations and we talked about these and you guys, you guys have implemented these in the previous project. Now we're going to be dealing with shading transformations. So they're going to be slightly different. Now we're going to compute shading we're going to compute some angles between vectors. So 
So we're going to do dot products of vectors. To be able to do anything with two vectors is that the first thing we need to make sure, let me repeat this, the first thing we need to make sure is that they need to be in the same space. Very, very important. You cannot do anything with two vectors that are in two different spaces. If two vectors are in two different spaces, I cannot tell the, the angle between those two vectors because, well, they're not in the same space. I first need to transform them into the same space so I can do things with them. Otherwise, they don't, well, they, I, I can't really tell, I cannot tell how they, uh, how those two vectors are related to each other, right? So, first things first, we need to move them into the same space. And for that, I need to pick a space. Now, this canonical view volume is a nice space, but it can include some non-uniform non -uniform scale and it can have perspective projection and stuff. This is a, not, a, not a nice space to compute angles between vectors because things are sort of deformed if I have perspective projection. So let's get rid of this one. I'm not going to be using that one. So I can do shading in model space or world space or view space. People oftentimes prefer to do shading in view space. And the reason for that is the, I need the view direction to, do, to compute the, the specular reflections, right? And the view direction, I can easily compute it in the view space because the position, the shading position of an object in view space is also a direction from the camera to that position, right? A position in view space is also the direction from the camera to that position. So the view direction is the opposite direction from the point that I'm shading towards the camera. That's the opposite direction, normalized obviously, that's going to be my view direction. So it's very easy to compute the view direction for a given point in view space. That's why people prefer using the view space. So let's, uh, let's stick with that and let's use the view space. Uh, so that means that I'm going to have to transform everything into the view space. So if my light direction is defined in world space, let's say that I have a directional light source and this direction omega is defined in, in world space, I need to transform that direction from the world space to view space. All right? I can do that. So this needs to be in the view space. The position of my model, all the triangle vertices are defined in the model space, right? So I need to transform them all the way to the view space. Probably for that, I will need the model view matrix, not the model view projection matrix. I need the model view matrix because this is where I want to end up, right? And once I'm, once I'm in this space, that's when I can do the transformation. All right. So this is the transformation that I will need. What else? I also need the surface normal. Again, the surface normal is going to be defined in the, the model, uh, in the model space. More specifically, I'm going to have a surface normal per vertex defined, and I'm going to have to transform that surface normal from the model space all the way to the view space, like so. And now that everything is in, in the view space, I can do this transformation. Now let's call this model view matrix M. So what I'm trying to do is that I'm going, I'm going trying to transform my um, object model properties like position on normal to the view space. All right. So I'm going to flip the order of these. So I'm going from model space to view space. So I can easily do that for positions. If position is P, if I multiply by the model view, model view matrix, I get P prime, which is the position in the world space, right? So the M in this case is the model view transformation matrix. All good? Well, you've done a version of this in a previous project. We used model view projection matrix that took us from the model space all the way to the canonical view volume. But that's not where we're trying to go. This time we're trying to go to the view space or the camera space, okay? So I can do that for positions. What can I do for the normal? Uh, it's actually going to be a little bit different. Here's why. Let me flip the order again. Let's say that I have a circle like this. I'm looking at this in 2D. Um, I'm, and I, I'm trying to figure out 
what that would look like in view space. Now, my transformation may include some non-uniform scale, which is totally fine. Now, that's going to be a little bit of a problem when I start thinking about the surface normals. So, if I, my object is like this, and this is what it looks like in view space, well, my transformation, if it's just rotations, they're easy to handle. I can use the same transformation matrix for transforming them. But see what happens if I apply non-uniform scale here. If this transformation includes non-uniform scale, you'll see that everything is squashed. But what happened? You see these normal vectors? They are not, they're no longer perpendicular to the surface. Over here, this one is not perpendicular to the surface. Right? It was like this originally after I applied this non-uniform scale, now it's not a normal vector anymore. It's not normal to the surface. Um, so what I need, actually, is to apply the opposite of that scale. I need to apply the opposite of that scale, and if I do that, that's when I'm going to get a vector that's going to be perpendicular to the surface normal. Of course, I mean, its vector is now much larger. Of course, I'm going to have to normalize it because I'm interested in unit vectors. But the direction is going to be the direction that I get by applying the inverse of the scale. Okay, I need to apply the inverse of the scale. Rotation, I need to apply the rotation as it is, but I need to apply the inverse of the scale if there's any any scale. Because if there's non-uniform scale, that's the way that I'm going to make sure that my normals are still perpendicular to the surface. Now, um, when I was teaching Introduction to Computer Graphics, I explained why this is supposed to be the case. I'm going to skip that detail now. And uh, if you're interested, we can talk about it later. But in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to skip that discussion for today. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, trust me when I tell you that what we need is the inverse of the scale. And the inverse of the scale is guaranteed to give you the perfectly perpendicular surface normal all the time if you just apply the inverse of the scale, okay? So, positions, I can handle them. Normals, I need to have a different kind of matrix because I need to apply the inverse of the scale, right? I mean, yes, okay, we could say we are using the homogeneous coordinate frames, uh, so for positions, I can um, apply them like this, and for normals, uh, these are direction vectors, so I can just set this W coordinate to zero, and just apply some four by four matrix as this one, and that would be okay. So this will basically eliminate the translation component of this transformation matrix. I don't care about translation, right? I just care about rotation and scale when I'm transforming directions such as normals. So I could just multiply this by the, the same matrix and, and it would be okay if I don't have any non-uniform scale. Right? If I have non-uniform scale, uh, this is not going to work out so well. Um, but just to be, because I'm using this last coordinate as zero, this is the same thing as multiplying this by the three by three portion of this matrix. So M three by three is just the three by three component of that matrix, and then I won't need this additional coordinate. Right? So I take this four by four matrix M and get rid of the last row and get rid of the last column that would give you the three by three matrix and three by three. If this does not include any non-uniform scale, I can use it for transforming normals. But if, but if it does include any non-uniform scale, then I cannot. Then this is not going to give me the, a, a surface normal that's going to be perpendicular because what I need is something that includes the inverse of the scale, right? So I need a different, I need a different transformation matrix for transforming surface normals. Now, this is not because surface normals are directions. This is because the surface normals are supposed to be perpendicular at all times. Right? That's why I don't want to apply exactly the same transformation. I want to apply a slightly different transformation to make sure that the normals are still perpendicular to the surface. Right? And that transformation is not going to be this. It's going to be slightly different. Now, remember we talked about this when we were talking about transformations we said that a transformation matrix can be written as rotation, scale, and rota like rotation applied first, and then some scale, and then another rotation. So any three by three matrix, 
I can separate it into a rotation and then a scale and then another rotation. It doesn't matter how you form this matrix, how many rotations and how many scales you performed, any three by three matrix, I can write it in this form. Okay, rotation and then some scale and then some other rotation. And what I need for transforming my surface normals is this matrix. I wanna have the same rotations before and after, but I wanna have the opposite, the inverse of that scale, right? The inverse scale, this is what I want. Now here's how I'm gonna get there. Now if I take my matrix, the three by three portion of that matrix, and I do something like an SVD decomposition to it and get these three matrices, then I can just convert the, compute the inverse of that scale matrix and form this, that would work, but that requires me to compute the SVD decomposition of a matrix, which is an expensive operation. I can do this much easier. Now follow this, it's a very nice trick, I love this. So if I take this matrix, all right, take this matrix, and I take the inverse of that matrix. The inverse of that matrix is this, right? This is the inverse of that matrix. Or when I apply the inverse into the parentheses, the order of the order of matrices here is going to change and I'm going to get the inverse this. So like if you apply rotation scale the other rotation, of course if you're going in the opposite direction, you apply the opposite of the last rotation, opposite of the scale and then the opposite of the first rotation, right? So of course this is the the matrix. So if I get the inverse of the matrix, this is what I get. Now if I apply the transpose of that matrix. After I take the inverse, I take the transpose of that matrix. I'm gonna get this. Okay, so what happened here? Let me put this transpose inside here. Now remember, remember, inverse of a rotation matrix was its transpose, bro. Right? So I can write this inverse R as R transpose. That applies to any rotation matrix. It's inverse, it is transpose. So if I just try to put this inside the parentheses here, let's go, of course it's going to take this order and then this order, so these transposes will cancel out each other, and I ended up with this. Uh, guess what, what's the transpose of a scale matrix? A scale matrix is a diagonal matrix, its transpose is itself. So transpose does nothing to it, so I end up with this, and guess what? These two are exactly the same. So all I need to do is to take the three by three component of my matrix, take the inverse of that and then transpose of it. And that's going to be the matrix that I'm going to be using for transforming my normals, right? So this is the trick that I'm going to be doing. Okay, let's talk about how we can do that in OpenGL. All right. So in the legacy OpenGL, when we did not have programmable shaders, OpenGL had all sorts of functionalities for handling lights and all sorts of different numbers of light sources and handling different materials and material properties. It was designed to do uh, foam shading, I believe, or maybe blend. I'm not 100% sure. I think it was doing blend shading, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but anyhow, you could just set these material properties. And uh, so if you look at OpenGL today, you we'll see these functions still exist and I'm gonna say don't use them all right <laughs> this is legacy OpenGL this is you're not supposed to be using any of this stuff okay just like we're not using any of the matrix transformation related OpenGL calls we're not supposed to be using these this stuff we're going to be doing our shading ourselves inside our own shaders all right but just for the sake of completeness, let's talk about this just a little bit. OpenGL, or the legacy OpenGL, was designed to do what's called go-out shading. Uh, so go-out shading is this idea that for shading a triangle, uh, what I do is I say I have this triangle and I have these three vertex normals for the three vertices. And for each one of those vertices, I can I can do shading based on the surface normal here defined at this vertex. I can do shading and compute a color for each one of these three vertices, okay? And if I compute these colors, then I can interpolate the color value here uh, on the triangle and find the color value at any point on this triangle using 
per century coordinates, right? So this is how the legacy OpenGL was designed. So it had this fixed function pipeline and it was doing shading right here, inside here. So this is, this is our, today it's our vertex shader. It's vertex shader. Why is it vertex shader? Because it was designed to do shading, right? Back in the day, we were doing shading here in vertex processing, and that was a vertex shader. So it was what was called, what we was doing was what's called the go route shading, that is do shading per vertex, and then over here, just interpolate the, interpolate the color values. So um, in the old days, in legacy OpenGL, before we had programmable shaders, the shading was happening right here. And then we were interpolating the color, the color values were interpolated in the rasterizer and the fragment, the, this fragment processing was just getting the interpolated color value. Now, this is not ideal because let me, let me go back and, and show you the garage. shading. as you can see this, the specular component over here is looking a little, little, um, triangulated, right? So this linear interpolation inside triangles make that specular component look not so great. But back in the day, it was, that's what we did because, you know, I, I couldn't do shading per pixel. That would be way too expensive. And we wouldn't have interactive computer graphics if we, if our uh, pixel processing was that expensive. We didn't have that many vertices, so it was much cheaper to do shading inside vertices. Today, we still don't have that many vertices. We still have a lot more fragments than vertices. But today, we, our GPUs are powerful enough to do per pixel shading, which is not a problem. So that brings us to what's called Fong shading. Fong shading is this idea. Don't mix this with the Fong material model. Fong shading is a slightly different concept. Regardless of what material you use, we do Fong shading today, right? So Fong, in Fong shading, I have a surface normal again for each one of my vertices. For computing the color at any point on that triangle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to interpolate the surface normals. So I'm going to interpolate the surface normals like so, I mean, my, okay, we're not going to do that in the graphics rendering pipeline ourselves. The rasterizer will do this for us. It's going to interpolate the surface normals we send to the rasterizer as our vertex attributes. Like when you output the surface normal from your vertex shader, it's going to pass through the rasterizer and the rasterizer will send the interpolated value to your fragment shader, right? So this is the value that we're going to be getting. And this value, you may think it's okay, but it isn't. Because if you just take three unit vectors and interpolate them like this, you're not necessarily going to get a unit vector anymore. So you need to normalize this, all right? So <laughs> it's, it's important that we normalize this vector because it's not going to be a unit vector, all right? So we're going to be doing foam shading inside our fragment shaders. That is, we're going to be getting our surface normals and we're going to be normalizing them. And that's what we're going to be using for doing the shading. Now, before I conclude, I want to show you this overview of uh, the stuff that you're going to have to do for implementing shading. First things first, on the CPU, you're going to have to compute all the matrices that we need. So what do we need? We need the model view matrix to be able to take our positions from model space and move them to the view space or camera space. We need model view projection so that we can take our positions from the model space all the way to the canonical view volume. Right? Remember, this is the one that we've been using for the previous project. Now, if you have model view and model view projection, uh, so model view is taking positions from model space to the view space. Model view projection is taking positions from model space all the way to canonical view volume. An alternative to that could be, instead of having model view projection here, I can just have the projection matrix. My vertex shader implementation will be slightly different. I first compute the view position. So you take your point from the model space to the view space and then apply projection. 
or you go from directly from model space all the way to the canonical view volume. So either you use this or you use just the projection component and compute your canonical view volume position slightly differently. Does that make sense? Because if I have the model view matrix and if I have the position matrix, I can in effect have the model view projection matrix. Or I can just send the model view projection matrix directly to my vertex shader and, and use that directly. This is what I would recommend that you do, but you know, the other one is also viable. So the other one that we're going to have to compute, the third one, is going to be the model view for model view matrix for transforming normals. Now, these two, the first two, will be used for transforming positions. So they're supposed to be four by four matrices. This one is designed to transform directions. So I don't need this one to be a four by four matrix. It can be, and it probably should be, a three by three matrix. Again, these two, model view and model view projection matrices, they're supposed to be four by four matrices because they include the translation and this one includes the perspective projection, right? So they're supposed to be four by four matrices. This one, it should be a three by three matrix because I'm just going to be using it for transforming a direction without any translation component. So I don't need to do the homogeneous coordinate trick for this. It should be a three by three matrix, okay? So in my CPU code, I'm gonna be computing these three matrices. Inside my vertex shader, I am going to be transforming my positions with the model view matrix. So that's going to give me my view space or camera space position. Okay. And also I'm going to be using the model view projection matrix to transform the position. That's going to give the position that my rasterizer needs, the GL position variable, right? My rasterizer will need to know the canonical view volume position. So I'm going to be using the model view projection matrix for that. So that's what we've been doing for the previous project. But this one, I also need this because I need the view space or camera space position of my, of my position. Why do I need that? Because using that, I can compute the camera space direction, view direction. The opposite of that vector is going to be my view direction vector. Also, I'm going to be transforming the per, per vertex normals. So each vertex is going to have a normal attribute, the vertex normal attribute or surface normal attribute. And I'm going to be taking that attribute value inside my vertex shader. I'm going to be transforming that attribute value as well. So that's what's going to happen inside a vertex shader. Not much. I'm just transforming stuff. Okay. Transform stuff. I transform the position to the uh, view space and I transform the normal to the view space. I also transform the position to the canonical view volume. All good? All right. Last thing to do, the main thing to do, actually implement the shading inside, inside the fragment shader. So the fragment shader will Im implement the shading. So this, the, the position that I compute here and the transform normal that I compute here will arrive at my fragment shader all interpolated, right? So I'm going to have the position and the normal inside my fragment shader. Inside my fragment shader, I'm going to take that position and convert it to the view direction. How do I do that? Just minus position normalized will be my view direction. I'm going to take the interpolated normal that I'm getting inside my fragment shader. I'm going to normalize it because it's an interpolated normal. It's not a normalized, it's not a unit vector. So I need to get the normalized vector. I need the unit vector. So that's what I'm going to be doing first. And then I'm going to be computing blend shading. Now, of course, I also need to know the light direction, right? So I can send the light direction to my fragment shader as a uniform value. Because let's say I have a directional light if I have a directional light, I know the light direction. I can just um, send it to my fragment shader and I can use that light direction. So the question, which space should I use for representing that uniform value? Obviously, it has to be the same space, right? I'm doing shading in the view space. So my light direction that I'm sending to my fragment shader must be in the view space as well. 
Question, should I transform my light direction to view space by multiplying it with the view matrix inside the fragment shader? Absolutely no. Because I don't want to do this very same computation every time my fragment shader is executed. Every time my fragment shader runs, I don't want to do the same computation again and again and again. So if I need to transform my light direction to the view, uh, view space, I need to do that only once. I can do that on the CPU and send it to my fragment shader, right? And then my fragment shader has the correct vector in the correct space and it can work with that. Same goes for a point light source. For a point light source, I have the light position. I just need to provide the light position in view space to my fragment shader as a uniform variable. And then I can compute the light direction inside my fragment shader by using the light position. Okay? You do all that and you add the shading and you'll be done with the next project. So uh, there's a lot to be done in the next project. So the project description that you, you'll see is suggesting a step-by-step -step implementation. So at each step, you can sort of verify your implementation and make sure that uh, everything is right. More specifically, it's gonna show you how to, uh, how you can debug the surface normals that you're transforming. So pay attention to that visualization that is defined in the project description. Uh, you may want to use something like that to make sure that you are transforming your surface normals correctly. It's very difficult to debug the, the final result of shading. If you're not getting your speculative values correctly, if they look a little weird, a little off, it's very difficult to debug that. It's much easier to look at the, the surface normals defined as colors on the surface. And if you have any problems with transforming the surface normals, you'll see it right there. So I, I would uh, recommend that you pay attention to that component. Uh, and if you haven't done, implemented shading before, I would recommend that you start implementing this uh, ASAP. If you have any issues implementing with this, it may take a long time. It's not necessarily going to take a very long time. This next project does not have to take a very long time, but it definitely can. And you don't have much time for it. And so uh, get cracking right away. All right, so this is what I plan to talk about for today. Good luck with your projects. I hope you get it done quickly without too much trouble. Uh, but again, start early because if you have any problems with your implementation, if you have any bugs, figuring that out and fixing it can, can take indefinitely long. So please start early. So this is your fair warning. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll see you next week.